Welcome to Endo Battery, where we are sharing our endometriosis journey and learning along the way. This podcast is in no way meant to diagnose or give medical advice, but a place where you can gain knowledge and information that can help you to not feel alone as well as become your best advocate. We want to learn with you and support you wherever you are in your journey. Thanks for joining us. I'm Shelby. And I'm Alana, and we're Endo Battery, charging our life when Endo drains us. battery today we are gonna have fun because that's what we do here and we have the honor of joining forces with dr larish dr duke formerly known in our world as euro bro and no bro and then as well as chelsea is here to join us and we are just gonna go over kind of the summit and the experiences we had and the benefits of having both the patients the doctors and all the different practitioners so buckle your seatbelts. Let's go, people. <laughs> it's going to be a ride. <laughs> Thanks, guys, for joining us today and taking the time to yeah. do it. Thanks for having us. Yeah. yeah. You, you forgot one uh, group of people in your list of people who were at the end of summit. Who did I forget? The, the advocates. That's, well, she said that's true. That's everybody. But what about the advocates? That's you guys. I think it was interesting to see the different kinds of advocates were there, too, from, like, books to podcasts mm-hmm. to lawyers to everyone i was like oh i thought it would be more advocate than doctor actually is what i thought oh, we, had, we had people from the state legislature from connecticut mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. I, that's a big deal you know um mm-hmm. for someone who has zero constituents in the room right because mm-hmm. we're in florida for the conference mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. connecticut uh, uh legislature to come down to florida is a, it's a huge deal mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. means that this is this is going to get you know, hopefully, uh, all these advocacy efforts will result in a national sort of spotlight that that propels us forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully, we sure hope so. Chelsea's going to yell it if it doesn't. I'm going to start yelling, if, and nobody wants that. So, yeah, I'm surprised they gave you a microphone for this podcast. I thought you scream into people's ears. <laughs> she might she's not she's only wondering i only got in trouble like three times by the hotel staff for being loud so i feel like that's pretty good yeah no i think uh you know you mentioned any that there were um you know there was gilcrest was down there and uh, shannon Cohn was there and uh you know of course heather Guidona is always there and um you know there was tracy who came down from from canada who'd written the book bleed and uh, Dana Browning was there. I don't know if you guys met Dana. Mm-hmm. She's mm-hmm. Awesome. Uh, she is uh, doing a lot of work with the legislature up up in mm-hmm. that uh, in that in that um, you know in New Jersey area. But um, yeah, I mean, it was just it's it's interesting to me how I guess it kind of highlights that endometriosis doesn't um, select any certain race or socioeconomic position or uh, I mean, it, it's so universal, right? That that mm-hmm. advocates come from every walk of life, and mm-hmm. um, it's it's just it's really powerful to hear all the stories from the advocates. Um, I mean, they are. I mean, they're in the trenches, and they are they're doing the work that hopefully hopefully changes things. Um, you know, and, and I don't know the right approach. I don't know. I, I don't know if it needs to be like legislation that that increases funding for endometriosis. I think that that's all well and good, and I appreciate those efforts. But I think that really, where the change is going to come from is the organizations who pass down the guidelines for the OB guys, for the urologists, for the general surgeons that's where it's going to come from first in my, in my estimation. I don't, you know, I, I I think the legislation is good, but like legislation is maybe just sort of going to increase funding for research, which again is great, but until the organizations like ACOG and the um, uh, AGL and I mean, the AGL has, has been much more radical, you know, than certainly than ACOG and, um, but until those organizations change the guidelines and, and recognize that endometriosis is a very complex disease, it, it requires a 
Uh, it, it requires specialized training. It requires a multidisciplinary team until until they sort of set forth those uh, protocols. Uh, I, I don't I don't see much changing. Well, you, I think, you think that, too. yeah, you you don't think that the groundswell will come from patients demanding better. Oh, I think it'll come from. I, I think it'll come from patients. I do. I do. Yeah. I think. It, I think it will come from patients changing the system, um, right. and 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 maybe with increased legislation and increased funding for research comes more advanced data about these sorts of things. But you know, unfortunately, the guidelines that we're using to dictate endometriosis care in this country, frankly, is outdated. It's mm -hmm. it's. You know, it, it's not. Um, uh, have you, by the way, have you ever looked at those guidelines at the references that they use? Oh yeah, uh, endometriosis or otherwise for anything. The yeah. guidelines are usually when they're written are based on data that's on average about eight years old. Yeah, yeah. And the guidelines are only refreshed once every eight years. Sure. Mm -hmm. Which means that you know by the end of life cycle of a guideline, it's sixteen years old. The data right. that it's I mean, that's no wonder change is slow, right? Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. But my understanding is that the, the data doesn't even change half the time. They just reinstate a lot of it. Like it's not actually all that updated. It's more. Well, no, I think they re-examine things. If, if a new emerging body of, of evidence mm -hmm. comes out, I, I think they do. Yeah, they do. They, they incorporate that, that, you know, I mean, they're constantly looking at papers, but until you have consistent papers, uh, showing the, you know, improved outcomes for patients seeing specialists uh, or a multidisciplinary team or a team that can handle, you know, advanced bowel disease or advanced urologic disease. I mean, it's, it's not going to, you know, it, those guidelines are still just, just not going to, you know, not going to change much on a ground level. And, you know, I mean, I, 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 don't, I hate to be like critical of ACOG, which is my overarching organization, but, you, you know, as I alluded to, or as I, I didn't allude to it, I said it earlier, you, you have 70,000 ob in the country and you have maybe less than 200 excision specialists, you know, they're not going to, I don't know, they're not going to be like, yeah, let's everybody send every, all your patients to these 200 people and and not try to do these surgeries yourself. I think that's, you know, there's a little bit of, of sort of self-preservation in that, but it's also know. money. Mm -hmm. Like if you talk about, if you think about like the insurance process and the fact that most doctors aren't going to get paid to do a specialized surgery, you're going to, I mean, yeah, bottom line like, is you're not going to get more surgeons that are going to follow suit and want to do the research and the study and the education to further yeah, I mean, you know, you get, I get, I get paid the same for a, a, you know, two or three hour excision surgery that someone would get paid to go in and burn a couple spots of endo, and that, that is frustrating. I mean, it's frustrating to me, and I, I'm not, you know, complaining financially. I, you know, I, I feel like I do okay, but I think I can see if you're in like a private practice and you're trying to keep the lights on for, you know, eight to ten employees, and and you're in the OR for a six hour surgery, and you make you know, a couple hundred bucks off it, you're, you're going to have a hard time um, with that. And so I think until there's a, a difference in, in reimbursement for excision versus, uh, you know, fulguration, I think, and I've talked about this before, the, it is kind of, that is a double-edged sword though, because if suddenly you start enticing um, surgeons to do excision surgery because there's more money in it, that's also not a great situation because you're going to have people who maybe aren't trained, well, who aren't trained to, to do those types of surgery. And that, that's a scary world too, because if suddenly everybody says, well, I'm an excision specialist, I'm an excision surgeon, I can do these surgeries, um, and, the, and they can't, that, um, that's going to lead, I think, to more complications for patients. You know, Adam, the, the only irony here is that it's hard enough to convince the general gynecologist to do a diagnostic laparoscopy, let alone sure. a or an excision. So they're not even doing that, right? So yeah. I don't know. I it's sort of disappointing. I, I will tell you one thing. You know, in um, if you look at the uh, AUA guidelines for pelvic pain, right? Endometriosis is not mentioned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wild. 
That's wild. That is that, that is awful. ridiculous. Yeah. How's that? Why how, you know they talk about all sorts of hydro distensions and uh, you know all, all this you know things that you can do, mm -hmm. which makes sense and some of which do not. But like the ideology, it's not even mentioned. Mm. That's nuts. That's yeah, that crazy. is that is uh, I and I don't know. I mean, I, I have a hard enough time keeping up with you know my literature. I certainly don't read the AUA guidelines, but yeah. um, I mean that that's ridiculous to me. That that is that is ridiculous that that you have a disease that affects you know uh, one in twenty people overall, or and then one in ten women you know overall you use those you know terms, um, but like that is a that is that's staggering to me. You, you have a disease that affects as many people, almost as many people as breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't even get mentioned. You know? Probably more, actually, if you think about it. I, I think it probably is. I mean, they say what breast cancer is one in eight and endo, endo is one in 10, but that's only from diagnosis. That's right. not even who have right. it. Right. I that's think there's, I think diagnosis. it's probably a higher, I agree that it's probably higher diagnosis or a higher, <laughs> a higher, uh, higher incidence of disease that's not properly diagnosed. Right. Yep. And then you think about, you think like today I saw, you know, I had my office hours today, right? So I saw, yeah, I think 22 patients and um, tw half of the patients today had urinary complaints that anybody who sort of has endometriosis on their radar would go, oh, you're 24 and you've had 14 UTIs in the last year, mm -hmm. none of which have actually ever grown a bacteria. Maybe yeah. we should think about this, right? Right half of the patients today. Now, granted, I, I'm seeing, pa you know, my, my patient population that I'm seeing is skewed towards that, right? By, right. by default. But, you know, I'm not the first urologist that they're seeing. Right. Certainly mm -hmm. not, right? I'm usually the second, if not the third urologist. And they've done all sorts of things to them, except for thinking about the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. You know, the, 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 the reality is that endometriosis has always been within the purview of the gynecological community, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or the, the treating gynecologist, mm -hmm. when in reality, it's a disease that affects sort of everything from diaphragm to, to nerves, to urinary tract, to bowel, right? It affects everything. Mm -hmm. And um, all of the specialists are very territorial. So nobody really embraces the idea. I shouldn't say nobody, but very few of us embrace the idea of multidisciplinary care. And I think that as a result of that, gynecology has always stayed under sort of the, the roof of, uh, I mean, endometriosis has always stayed under the roof of gynecology. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the gynecologists, you know, Adam, you're, you're highly trained, right? And you're, you're, a, you're a, a talented surgeon. But if you think about the, the general obstetrics gynecologist who graduates from residency, yeah. I mean, they have no business doing surgery on anybody. That's the reality, you know? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you hate to say that, but it's, I mean, it's, when you look at the number of cases that are required to graduate from a general surgery program or a urologic program or uh, any sort of, you know, ENT, you look at the numbers of surgical cases that you are required to have in order to be considered proficient. Uh, and then you look at the OBGYN numbers. And like, I think you're only supposed, I, I, and don't quote me on this, I need to go back. But like, when I went through my OBGYN residency, I think that you only needed to have 10 hysterectomies to be considered as proficient in hysterectomies. Whereas the general surgeon needs to have like 300 appendectomies or 300, you know, I mean, it's like 10, like 10 is you, right yeah, you ready for this? You ready for this? I know. I know we have... What? Ready? Yep. In 2018, the ACGME, which is like the body that, yep. that credentials residents announced changes to minimum hysterectomy numbers required for graduation. 20. The required number of abdominal hysterectomies that's open mm -hmm. decreased, decreased from 30 to 15 mm -hmm. and laparoscopic hysterectomies from 20 to 15. Mm -hmm. so, so you, you are do... supposed to know how to do a hysterectomy mm -hmm. as a pro, right? Which is a dangerous operation. It is. After having done 30 hysterectomies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, a, it's, it, it's, it's astounding to me. And, and it's, I mean, there, there is no other, like I graduated my ob residency with something like, 400 C-sections and like 
six or 700 vaginal deliveries. And I graduated my fellowship program or my residency program with like 40 or 50 hysterectomies. And I was very aggressive about getting hysterectomy. Like I was staying late. I was, I was uh, going over my hours. I was doing them post call when I wasn't supposed, because I wanted, I was like, this is ridiculous. Like I need to, to learn how to do these. And then when I matched into a fellowship, you know, I did something like a thousand cases in two years, which is crazy, right? To go from having done like, you know, 30 or 40 hysterectomies. And I was, again, very aggressive about trying to get hysterectomies. Um, and so we've sort of like turned loose this generation of, of OB guys who, you know, the, the, the standard is not as good as it probably should be. <laughs> and that's, um, mm -hmm. well, it's not, it's just not, it's not, I mean, that, that's, that's staggering to me that, that the 2018 requirements were 15 history, 15 laparoscopic hysterectomies, and you're good to go. You're good to go. You know, that's nuts that's, to me. That's nuts as a patient to hear that because it almost it's terrifying. It's terrifying. Right. Like yeah, it's, scary. it's, it's infuriating too, because the doctors that are performing this, that maybe some of them shouldn't be doing this. They're the ones that don't have to live in the body that they're operating on. And so they don't see the outcomes oftentimes of what could potentially ha be happening. Or, you know, I don't know, maybe they could catch something if they actually knew what they were looking at. Something. Guys, the, the irony here is that hysterectomy is a chip shot compared to doing good excision mm -hmm. surgery. For oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm so, sure. Yeah. So, so literally, the, I, I don't, I, I mean, unless your program has somebody who's incredibly high volume in endometriosis sort of as part of the faculty that's training residents, um, the chances of somebody seeing an excision case as a resident, if you're like in a general program, even at a university program, it's pretty low. Mm. I, I think I think that is changing, though, as more and more residents are being exposed to uh, as more and more, you know, minimally invasive fellowship programs are coming. Like when I went through the, the MIGS fellowship application cycle, there were, I think there were like 18 or 19 programs, maybe 22. I, I don't remember, but it was low. And now there's something like 48 or 50. I mean, it's, and that was For just, me, you know, I went through in 2000. That's, that's, MIGS, that's MIGS specifically. That's not a Yeah, that's MIGS specific. But when I went through in 2012, there were like 22 programs and now there's like 48. So, and almost all of them are academic. It used to be like in the old days, the old days, like in the early 2000s, the the MIGS fellowships were all just like you would give up like a year or two of your salary and you'd go work with Tommy Lyons or you'd go work with David Redwine or you'd go work with Ken or you'd go uh, and you you might not get paid much or you might. It wasn't like this official sort of fellowship that it is now it was basically almost like a like a mentorship. Mm -hmm. And those were the MIGS fellowships back in the day. Uh, that's how Cindy Mossbrucker trained like excellent, excellent, you know, endosurgeon. She went and trained. Uh, she had a very successful uh, OB guy in practice in Hawaii gave it all up to go and train with David and Ben for a couple of years, and so that was how MIGS fellowships were run. Now the the vast majority, you know, of MIGS fellowships are under the umbrella of an academic program, and so residents uh, are getting exposed to MIGS specialists. You know, almost every almost every academic program not almost everyone, but a lot of academic programs that I know of, like they now have a MIGS fellowship. And so those residents are seeing that. Whether or not it's sinking in, I don't know. Whether or not they're going into those surgeries and, and thinking, oh, wow, this is really beyond what I could or should be doing. Right, what, what I guess what I was saying was that even if you have a MIGS fellowship, right, it doesn't mean that you necessarily have somebody who's trained in excision as a That's faculty. True. Right. Yeah. So they may do tons of hysterectomies and myomectomies and, and, um, that's true. Pulpopexies, but they may not see a single case of endo. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, it, it's it, anyway, the, the point is you're, you're, if you make the choice to have surgery, um, you have to be really sure that the person is operating and you know what they're doing. And that's, that's a challenge today. Mm -hmm. But you even know, if they believe that they can, that's the thing is like, I had two surgeries by a doctor who I fully believed in because she had told me that her bread and butter in her practice was endometriosis, that she operated on them all the time, but she was still delivering babies. Mm -hmm. So had I known prior to that, maybe that the outcome would have been a lot different. But I mean, she did the whole, you know, C-section incision for 
endo all over my bowels, all over everything else. And so, but I didn't know any different. So it's like, it's partly educating the patients on how to be their best advocate and like getting and getting the word out about the understanding of endometriosis. But then adversely, it's about doctors stepping up into that space of like recognition of endometriosis. Like, I think that we are still at the forefront of that because a lot of doctors don't even recognize endometriosis. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I, I, mean, I have the surgical thing, but then the recognition gets missed. But that's, you know, that's on us. So, you know, the people who, so I, I, I have a training program, right, for residents and, and we had a fellow for the last two years. And so our residents, we have, uh, I think four or five, uh, four a year. Um, and, you know, they all do a substantial time in the OR with us doing endosurgery. So they get exposed to 400 cases a year of endo. Now, there's four of them. So you have to imagine that it's divided pretty equally. It's still 100 cases a year that they get exposed to, right? Um, the majority of time spent in the operating room with those on those 100 cases has very little to do with surgical technique and more like, where's the endo? Point it out to me. Mm -hmm. Show me. Where else is it? Where else is it? Where else is it? Okay, yeah, you're pointing out the, the powder burn lesion, but is there anything else? You don't think there is? Okay, let me show you where it is. And then we sort of go and highlight. And you have to really, you can't, nobody knows what endo looks like. Uh, no, nobody's born with eagle eyes, right? That It doesn't work other than CY Lou. Nobody's born like that. Yeah. You, have to, you have to get exposed and recognize patterns. And, you know, uh, but, but that's on us. That's on uh adam and myself and sort of the younger generation uh of surgeons who are committed to this to sort of really push it forward uh adam do you have do you have uh, trainees with you at all i don't no i don't have i don't have that's trainees. A shame. Yeah. that's a shame it is yeah i mean it is i you know who i end up like i end up training a lot of so like a lot of pelvic floor physical therapists will come and observe surgery with me mm -hmm. and i actually have a lot of like high school students who will come and like you know, they think they're interested in medicine and they'll come and like watch me do surgery and stuff. But yeah, I don't have any, I don't have any trainees. And it is a shame because I think there is an opportunity to show them that endometriosis, the vast majority of times is not powder burn, blue, black lesions. It's white, it's clear, it's fibrotic, it's yellow. And, and it's sometimes not obvious. And sometimes you just have to, you know, you have to know, and that's the difference between doing you know, five endometriosis fulguration surgeries a year versus doing, you know, three or 400 a year, uh, mm -hmm. where you're actually sizing it to know what that tissue feels like. But, um, you know, I, it's funny. I don't, I look back on my residency training and I, I honestly, in my heart of hearts, I don't remember seeing a single endometriosis surgery. And I know I had to have at some point, but I think everything I learned in fellowship from, from working with Scott and CY is that's like my memory of endometriosis. Like, oh, oh, that's what, it, but like, I look back to my residency program and I honestly do not remember doing a single case of endometriosis. Hmm. Um, I'm sure I could pull up my, you know, my, you have to like report your surgery volumes when you graduate and everything. Right. But I honestly, I, I honestly do not remember doing a single case of endo my entire four years of training. I, um, I used to finish the urology cause I, you know, I'm a urologist, but I, mm -hmm. I like to joke that I should have been a gynecologist cause I, I love uh, surgery, but, um, I used to, so I had a guy who was, a, he's a very well-established endometriosis surgeon in New York. His name is, um, Tamara Sechkin. He's a big name in, in endometriosis and, and he was an attending at my hospital. So I would fly through the kidney stones and the prostate cancers and the BPH and all sort of the general urology stuff. And, um, I jet over to that room. So I, I probably did, I don't know, maybe sex 700 endometriosis cases wow. as a resident, mm -hmm. as a urology resident, right? Mm -hmm. Because guess who didn't want to do them? The, 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 the residents that one yeah, the one wanted to no, do they them. hate those cases. They hate, they hate those cases because they're long and they're challenging and you got to, you know, break your back doing them. Um, but, you know, I, I loved it. I, I was as happy as one could be. So, you know, I, I think we all have a responsibility to, to train people if, if there's an interest. I, you know, is there, is there a university program by you or, or 
or not really? Yeah, I mean, we do have the opportunity to 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 train. Um, the UW University of Washington has um, they've talked about sending some um, at least medical students out to to scrub in, and and that you know honestly that might be a good place to start because if you can train people who aren't necessarily going to go into gynecology, if you can train like family practice doctors and pediatricians mm-hmm. to recognize the signs and symptoms of endo, you could probably save a lot of time. You know, mm-hmm. if, if you, if you, if you have an entire generation of, of family practice doctors who are like, Oh, I have a 15 year old with uh, nausea, vomiting, bloating, uh, constipation, diarrhea, I'm not going to send her for colonoscopy, endoscopy, and tell her she has IBS because IBS is way more rare in a 15 year old than endometriosis is. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to say, just tell every teenager they have IBS. I'm going to start thinking endo. Mm-hmm. And that would be, I mean, that's, that would be huge. Uh, if we could start, if we could start thinking endo and not trying, I've never seen a specialty that goes to such great lengths to convince a patient they don't have a disease. Mm -hmm. And I I don't understand that. I don't understand the, uh, you have cyclical pelvic pain when you're 15, you have all these GI symptoms, uh, you have painful sex, you have painful urination. Um, It's probably not endo though. You should go see GI, you should go Mm -hmm. see psych, you should go see like, and, and I'm fully convinced that the reason that that is done is because you don't, they don't want to diagnose endometriosis because then, then those patients become their endometriosis patients. And if they don't really know how to properly treat the disease other than to just, you know, if they don't know how to treat the disease other than just throw hormones at it, 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 you know, it, it's just, it's, it's just, it's so mind boggling to me. I don't like, I, I truly don't understand. Like I see patients day in and day out, you know, who have had every GI workup imaginable. They've had, they've had every, you know, they've had HIDA scans for their gallbladder. They've had, uh, if they still have spine- their gallbladder. What's that? If they still have, if they still have oh, their yeah. gallbladder. Yeah. Right? We see patients all the time, like 22 year old, like, you know, abdominal pain. Well, their gallbladder is gone because it must be it. But like, I, I just, it like, and to me, it's obvious because I spend all day, every day talking to patients about, I know, but like, like these are signs and symptoms that are not, they're not a mystery. They're, it's not some zebra that walks through we, in the medical world. We call things, you know, horses and zebras and zebras are supposed to be like these, uh, you know, really obscure diagnoses that nobody can figure out. Like these are not zebras coming into your office. These are horses that if it walks, you know, if it clops like a horse and, and neighs like a horse, it's a horse. And, and it's not a zebra. And, and like, we go to such great lengths to convince patients that they don't have a disease. And so when patients come to my office after eight to 10 years of this, they almost don't believe me. And I'm like, no, this is so obviously endometriosis. I'm sorry that you've, you've had to deal with being told for 10 years. And they're like, well, what makes you so sure? What makes you so sure? I saw five other gynecologists. Yeah, and they told me there's no, way, there's no way this is endometriosis. What makes you so sure? I don't believe you. And I'm like, well, okay, but I'm right. <laughs> you know, like yeah. it, it's just, it's just such a weird. What is your answer when they say that, Adam? I'll tell you what my answer is. Show me yours. I'll show you mine. Well, I, I just, I just, I just tell them, I, I, I point, I've got a poster on my wall of symptoms that, that my partner and I created of, and I'm like, you have all these symptoms, right? You have endometriosis. I say, I have, I say you have endometriosis until proven otherwise. It is, there is not a chance that you have IBS or, whatever at 15, 16 years old, like this, the, the, the common thread here is endometriosis. And that's what I convince them. I, I tell them that all of your symptoms match endometriosis. I will bet my house that if I take you to the OR, you will have endometriosis. And I've Oof. never been wrong. That's a big gamble. Hmm. A small house. Come on. It's not a very nice <laughs> house. Yeah. And it's in Idaho. It's in Idaho. <laughs> But I, I've never been wrong. I've never, I've never taken a patient to the OR who I was convinced had endometriosis. You know, I mean, maybe they don't have like crazy disease. They might have something else, but like, 
you know, they always have like glomerulations on their bladder or hunter ulcerations, or they have uh, a very, you know, disease looking uterus that you would consider, you know, you would suspect they had adenomyosis. Like there's always something, there's always pelvic floor dysfunction. You know, I, I can't, I've done something like three, I think I've done between fellowship and now something like 3000 endometrial surgeries. And like, I don't think I've ever had a patient who doesn't have pelvic floor dysfunction on some level. So like, there's always, there's always something that you're going to find. Right. Um, so that's my answer. And I tell patients that like, I've, I've done 3000 endometrial surgeries. I've never, I've never not found endometriosis in, on some level, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I have to say, and yet here we are, right? And yet right. I'm the fifth urologist that you're seeing. So, you know, something's got to give at some point, right? And they go, yeah, well, I saw four other people before you and they didn't think of that. And I go, I know. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and here I we know. are. And here we are. And I go, now, let me, let me guess. How many times have you been put on antibiotics for UTI that you didn't have? Mm -hmm. And they're like, hmm. Yeah, and, and after the third time, you know, my belly started bloating, right? And you're like, well, and then I got a diagnosis of SIBO. I'm like, uh-huh, mm -hmm. right? So like, th there's, there's this uh, denial. It, it really is denial on part of- For sure, denial. Life. It's denial. Uh, and that's not a river in Egypt. Um, that, <laughs> that, you know- that joke. That, I'll be here all <laughs> um, no, th there's this denial that, you know, the most common, you know, Hockham's razor of the simplest of explanations is best. That's a good, that's a really good way to think in medicine. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know why for endometriosis is somehow excluded. I think Adam, you alluded to, you know, what happens when you do find an endometriosis patient, if you don't know what to do about it. You know, that's probably that's probably the reason why they don't want to make the diagnosis because right. right, yeah, you can't and I've got to deal with problem. you, and I, I've got to deal with you, and I don't know how to deal with you. Mm -hmm. So I have to go to great lengths to convince you that you don't have this disease. You know, well, I'll tell you. You know, I, I think we wanted to change the dialogue on that pretty severely. Where the drug companies, right, mm -hmm. because yeah. they really wanted people to make the diagnosis so that they could be prescribed the Orlissas and and you know uh, Luprons of the world. Mm -hmm. um the reality is you know that's coming back now you know the data is showing that that's not a great way to go overall right and so we're back to sort of square one i i will say this about the drug companies i'm not a big drug company guy i don't think they um in the world of endometriosis i don't think they've done much to to help women um what <laughs> get yeah. out Shot. what They've, they've improved my bone loss, in case you were wondering. Right? Yeah, yeah, your hair, your hair loss. My hair loss, my side. bone loss, my yeah. eyelashes are falling out. It's fine. I'm fine. <laughs> you know, I, but, but, but the one thing I will say that they have done, they, they have done one thing, which is that they've, they've put a lot of money behind uh, sort of uh, patient, patient sort of, uh, awareness of the disease mm -hmm. and by I hiring think, celebrities uh, to tell them to take nonetheless no look you know nonetheless right the, the fact of the matter is they have poured a lot of money into that and i think that has had a positive impact uh in terms of uh patient awareness of the disease and maybe provider awareness of the disease obviously to nefarious ends right of prescribing these drugs that don't work but it's the first step in the right direction in my sure. opinion you know well, it's scary that I can recognize endo in people before their typical OBGYN does. Like as a patient, I can tell I've had, I don't know how many women come to us and say, I don't know if I have endo, but what you guys are talking about sounds really like what I'm going through. And be like, oh, what are you going through? And they'll tell us, I'm like, I, I can't diagnose you, but I would definitely get it looked at because it sounds very much like you have endo. Yeah. And every time that they've gone into surgery, every single one of them, mm -hmm. endo. Yeah. I yeah, probably diagnose more than some OBGYNs actually. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not a mystery. 
I, I don't I don't know why we've made it a mystery. I don't know. And I keep saying we because I'm talking about, you know, I'm part of the, the general OBI yeah. community too. I haven't delivered a baby in eight years, but um, you know, I, I talk about we, but we as a as a community, even of physicians, not just OB guys, have made it this like mystery, like, oh, well, you probably, you know, you probably don't have endometriosis. Stop thinking you have endometriosis. <laughs> you don't, you don't have it. Oh, you've had, you've had three kids. You can't possibly have right? endometriosis. Mm-hmm. You've had children. Like, um, uh, well, just, Adam, you know, you know, that's, that all starts at the, at the medical school level. Right. So I'm does. not a doctor. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe a little older than you, but not, not by much. And, and I can tell you that in all four years of medical school, the only time endometriosis was was discussed was a single line on a single slide, and it talked about chocolate cysts. Mm-hmm. That's it. Four years of medical school for disease that affects one in ten women, mm-hmm. right? So, so if that's the case, right? And again, I'm not a dinosaur. I keep looking in the mirror and telling myself, <laughs> I'm not a dinosaur. Just but, keep pushing yourself up. Yeah. No, but, you know, really, I, I mean, you know, it's not that long ago. Um, and and it just wasn't, it wasn't on the agenda at all. And you guess know, what? It hasn't changed all that much. It hasn't changed. I will tell you, I, I actually, you know, people talk about, like, where they were when John Lennon died and what they were doing or where they were, where they were, what they were doing when the moon landing happened or where they were and what they were doing when Kurt Cobain died or, you know, like these, these sentinel events that happen in, in your lifetime. I remember exactly where and when I first heard about endometriosis and it was in 2000, uh, uh, 2006, I was a second year medical student doing, we used to do these like once a week we'd go and just shadow uh, uh, a primary care doctor for like, two hours on a Wednesday, you know, and then we'd go around and I was a second year medical student and we had a patient who she was like 17 came in with chronic abdominal and pelvic pain, super painful periods, um, uh, GI symptoms. And I remember my attending my, my family practice, uh, Dr. Uh, De La Vana, Anna De La Vana. She was from the Philippines. I remember exactly who she was. And she said, she said, what's that? Shout out. Yep. Shout out. She said, she said, what do you think? What's your differential? And I was going IBS, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis. Uh, and she's like, well, what about endometriosis? And I went, what's that? And she goes, you're at the end of your second year of med school. And you've never heard of endometriosis. I said, no, what's endometriosis? She goes, go look up endometriosis. So I got up my Robin's pathology. Remember the little Robin's pathology book? And it was the little pocketbook that was in my short white coat because I was a dumb little med student. And I pulled it out and there were two lines in Robin's pathology about endometriosis being rogue, uh, rogue endometrial tissue that causes inflammation and pain in the body. And I remember hearing about that. And then I didn't hear about endometriosis again until I had a single lecture on it in residency, I think my second or third year of residency. So I heard about it one time in medical school. And like I said, I remember exactly where I was and what I was doing and whose office I was in and reading those two lines. And then I didn't hear about it again, a single other time. I didn't hear about it again on my OBGYN rotation as a medical student, because we were just in on labor and delivery, just Mm. living babies all the time. Mm. I didn't hear about it in residency until my second or third year when I got a single lecture on it. And as I said, I honestly don't remember doing a single endometriosis surgery in residency. I'm sure I did, but I'm sure we just sort of like put a scope in and like, you know, uh, fulgurate a few spots. (laughs) But honestly, I don't remember it. And Hmm. whether, you know, part of my residency, I have like, you know, traumatic stress where I've just sort of blocked out most of my residency, but to, to, only hear about endometriosis or only remember hearing about it one time in medical school and then maybe one time in residency for a disease that affects one in 10 women. That is unbelievable, Mm -hmm. unbelievable. And, Mm -hmm. and uh, it just, I like, why, like, what are, what are we, what are we doing? What are we doing as medical schools, as residencies, uh, you know, we're training people to think that it's everything but endometriosis. Is that your, is that your Robbins? I'm trying to get it on 
is it it's not focusing hold on so you're oh. all out of focus you have to put it on your face yeah <laughs> yeah it's still it's still, it's, it's still it's not recognizing you, you have some weird filter on your background that makes everything out of focus except your face backgrounds and effects none there you Boom. go perfect there. now show the book now show right, the book ready? so yeah. pathological basis of disease yep robin uh, uh, i can't i'm like doing laparoscopy backwards here <laughs> It's, there okay, we, there we are. Pathological Basis of Disease, seventh edition. It's mm -hmm. a big, thick book, right? Yeah, well, I had the pocket one that went in my my white coat. Big, thick textbook. Cool. I just pulled it out. I could just picture Adam pulling that big old endometriosis <laughs> and adenomyosis is a grand total of three paragraphs. Three paragraphs on endometriosis. There we go. Um, yes. <laughs> I mean, I mean, they made the book, so. There's that. There's that. To two diseases that affect, you know, a lot of people. So I just saw this, um, the, like an endographic. Now you're probably gonna have to like go back and according to federal funding. So what do you think is one of the top federally funded thing, like diseases or erectile dysfunction? Impotence. Yeah, I was gonna say impotence. Yeah. I mean, that's probably up there, but that didn't make the list on this one. Right. So multiple sclerosis, ready? Mm -hmm. It affects one in, in 286 people. And you get federally funded. It's $127 million, So $110 per person. Guess what endometriosis gets? Zero. <laughs> A dollar. Uh, 10 million. Oh. Endometriosis oh. probably gets 20 million. Right? 21 million so a dollar 25 a person or yep. per case yeah so two endometriosis will get you on the subway in new york city right <laughs> right yeah two patients with it yep and it affects one in ten just diagnosis and it, obviously we know that it takes forever to be diagnosed so mm -hmm. i mean put that one in your pocket do you want to carry this around adam yeah i would love to okay <laughs> Listen to you. <laughs> Pull it um, out next I'm time someone doubts you. Yeah, I'm just texting the pack you back. We had a question about a patient. Sorry. So. Oh. Oh. Doing doctor things. Okay. I well, know. I, sorry. We'll yeah. let it slide. This once. It's crazy. I don't. It see. This is the stuff that if we didn't get the opportunity mm -hmm. to spend time with you guys, we wouldn't know this stuff. Right. Yeah, and this is a lot of the stuff that we talked about when we were at the summit, you know, and sitting around and sitting by the pool until one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, three way too late, three o'clock. It was late. <laughs> I slept like nine hours the entire week. It was a long week. So, um, but that's kind of one of the things that we were, we talked about is these types of things, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, some of the inconsistencies in the funding and the inconsistencies in the treatment and, it was really interesting being able to sit and hear it from your perspective, because we can see it from our perspective and how we mm -hmm. were treated. But to hear what you guys struggle with on your end and, you know, what your restrictions are, you know, either put on by ACOG or whoever, you know, is making the rules for you guys. It's it's definitely it was nice hearing both sides of it. So and it also made me very angry. Mm -hmm. so. It also made me angry for you guys, though. Right. Because I feel like for you're literally changing women's lives. Like mm -hmm. I yeah. don't. You guys should have a national holiday. You should. Definitely. Like we should have endo bro euro bro holiday. <laughs> Get right on that. I mean, maybe. I'm <laughs> all about <laughs> endo bro holiday. We do like endo you guys. bro weekend. Yeah, yeah. yeah. endo bro. <laughs> <laughs> we should take. We should take a cruise. Yeah. Oh, turn it into a perfect. Cruise. Yeah, I'll take it. No, nobody's gonna drown on that cruise for sure. <laughs> <laughs> At least you know CPR. I'll be able to alert if anybody falls in the water. You'll be able. You'll know. I'll yell. Chelsea will have her whistle. <laughs> yeah. No, she Can doesn't need a whistle. She doesn't need a whistle. Yeah. Need a whistle. No. You do not want a urologist or a gynecologist doing CPR. We know nothing. <laughs> no, that's not true. I just did. I just did BLS, and I'm proficient. Uh, yeah, the, uh, <laughs> forget the L. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think, I think that, but what the point of that is, is that as patients and ad, as advocates, we get upset that you guys have to jump through the hoops to even practice and save lives. I mean, mm -hmm. you're just truly, you're saving lives. I would not be in the posi position I'm in now if I hadn't had surgery. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, and, and honestly, I think that I would have been in a better position had I not had multiple surgeries by a doctor who didn't know how to do surgery correctly. Mm -hmm. So it just makes us infuriated that you guys have to walk through that. But (laughs) on the plus side is that our frustration and anger with that. And then what we've gone through, I think is going to, that's ultimately what I think is going to push this forward and the changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this conference, because like we've said, it's so great having everybody together, advocates, doctors, you know, PTs, everybody that comes together where this is such a unique space, not like any other conference. And so we're all able to kind of link arms and move forward rather than, you know, doctors separately or what have you, or just doctors alone or patients alone, and then going from there. And we can laugh doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to, yeah. I mean, you have to, you know, if you, it's one of those, like, if you don't laugh, you'll cry kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And that's, uh, um, it, there are a lot of laughs at the endometriosis summit and it's in the setting of, we're talking about very, very difficult, emotionally triggering things, you know, like we talked about earlier, the white, the, you know, the whiteboard early from a couple of years ago. And, um, these are things that are really, really hard to talk about, but, and I think, the the way that the endometriosis is set up is it creates a safe space where people can talk about those things in a judgment free mm-hmm. place where no one's gonna think oh well that's well, she's a weirdo you know kind of thing it's it's like this it, it's such a safe space where people feel like they can open up but I think because there is such an outpouring of emotion those laughs become really important and and, and that is a way of you know that is a way of releasing emotion and it's just it's such a it's just such an important event for that reason, you know, and, and our, on our level too. I mean, I laughed, we talked about that at the beginning of the podcast. Like I, my face hurt when I got home from the, the summit, just, you know, it's laughing and and talking and, and just being in a, a tribe of people that mm-hmm. all, all want the same thing. We want it as much as you do. We really do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and, yeah. and you also had us there. To help you with that right we were pretty laughing sure. you mean or- yeah the laughing <laughs> i mean i i think that it was cathartic for everyone like we said it was just a great word that's a great word cathartic yeah. yep i like yeah. that yep. mm-hmm. and it added the humanity back to uh, for me it added humanity back to practitioners in a way like it what you guys are not just doctors <laughs> not just doctors you, i'm but, barely a doctor <laughs> <laughs> depends on the day yeah. but <laughs> but i you're not just doctors you're humans mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. emotion behind that and we're not just patients we're humans right, right. and i think sally and and dr vidali they have done a fantastic job of facility facilitating that because without their facilitating that i don't think it would be what it is like, I think it would be very stuffy <laughs> because they aren't very stuffy people. Right. No, they're funny and well. No, a, a lot, a lot, uh, real credit needs to be given to Sally. Um, Cause y- you know, Sally's the real engine behind that. Um, mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah. And, and she's, uh, you know, she's a force to be reckoned with. Mm-hmm. And uh you know, that force sometimes is a hurricane that knocks a house down, but sometimes houses need to get knocked down, right? Mm-hmm. To, to mm-hmm. rebuild. And, and, you know, I can tell you, Sally, Sally just won um, the best patient advocacy award at the urology uh, conference, at the international urology conference. She's presenting about wow. endometriosis. Yeah. Yeah. She awesome. is the presenter on endometriosis at the so conference. Awesome. Love you that. know, so real kudos to Sally and, and to Andre, obviously, and, and uh, kudos to everybody who shows up. I mean, you know, it's not, it, it wouldn't be the same conference without all of the parties showing up to mm-hmm. sort of the, the town hall style meeting mm-hmm. where everybody gets to see their people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Was it, it, is it good for you guys to see the different techniques with the other doctors? Yeah. I mean, look, I, I, I think we all do, similar things right Right. so i think it it validates that what you're doing is not crazy right right very Um, important 
Yeah. You know, I, I thought what was super interesting is, you know, one of the one of the surgeons showed a very straightforward peritonectomy. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And they presented right. it as a radical example. Right. He said this is considered <laughs> a radical exam. I'm like, what are we talking? You know, yeah, I'm that's, like, that's, like, a, that's like bread and butter, you know, that's mm-hmm. bread and butter. And so that makes you go. All but right. That's radical for a generalist. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Mm-hmm. But it makes you go, oh, OK. I'm not crazy, right? This is reasonable. Um, you know, you you sort of put a framework together in in seeing what other people are doing that validates what you're doing, and then you learn little snippets from people. Like I can tell you, we used to suture the ovaries closed after a, a ovarian cystectomy. Mm-hmm. We now we learned from Chuck Miller that um, the technique is using fibrin glue, and that's all we do now. And hmm. that, that's a recent, that's from this conference. That's, mm-hmm. that's Good old yeah. yeah, I've actually stopped, I've actually stopped doing that too. So, yeah. yeah. You know, and, you know, so, so I think, you know, I gave a course, a hands-on course on, on sacral neuromodulation and Botox uh, to some, yeah. some providers who, who showed up and, and, you know, maybe that moves the needle somewhere, you know, from, from a urinary health perspective and from a bowel health perspective, I just think that the the beauty of everybody coming together is you get to learn new things, you get to reinforce what you're doing is right, and then you get to sort of tweak minor things that that you go, wow, you know, you know, the the simple idea of using the fiber and glue, it's like a new opera, it's a different operation Mm -hmm. all of a sudden, right? And you get all jazzed up about and that reinvigorates you. So Mm -hmm. I think it's all all cool stuff. Mm -hmm. It was good to see the doctors not always agree, though. Yeah. I liked that. I liked it when. Well, you're never. You're gonna. You're never gonna have doctors agree about everything. Mm -hmm. Well, that's because that's because what we're doing is not the standard of care. So everybody has their has their method and version of how to progress the field and how to move things forward. And so when you're doing surgeries that are that are outside of the limitations of what is considered the standard of care, you are going to push the envelope the way that CY Lou pushed the envelope, the way that David Redwine pushed the envelope, the way that, you know, Andrea and, and Ken and Scott Fur and, and Cindy Mosbrooker and, and, you know, the way that they're pushing the envelope with like, um, you know, thoracic endo and complex bowel endo. And, you know, I mean, it, like olden days, it was like, Oh, they have thoracic endo. Oh, just don't touch it. Don't, you know, Oh, it's, it's fine. It's, they'll be all right. You know? So what they cough up blood. Um, and it's, you know, so I, it is, it, it is, um, it's, it's just a, such a cool, like, you know, and you've said that it's just such a cool environment where we can all, you know, sort of feed off each other and learn new. Th- I learned, I learned so much at the endometriosis summit and I, you know, I learned a lot about myself too. Cause I have this like weird imposter syndrome where I feel like I somehow don't belong in the same room as these people. Um, I'm working on it in therapy, but like I showed Jose. These, these are like the top, top endometriosis surgeons who are there. And I'm sort of sitting in this room like, Arr. and then I'm watching some of their videos and something like, oh, actually I can do that. I'm pretty good at that. You know? So it, it is, it is a cool experience for, from that perspective too. Not only like learning new techniques to really push things forward, but also sort of, you know, like you said earlier, any like validating that what you're doing is that is the correct way to do things and and you're not doing things that are you know that nobody else would do like we're all kind of you know yes we're disagreeing with each other but we're all kind of moving forward in the same direction and doing things the same way as each other which is excise the shit out of this disease right Mm -hmm. cut it all out right you know yeah, it was interesting because like we've talked about this about how it because the world of endo is really changing all the time that it's interesting to see even for you guys to have those discussions be like, oh, I never even thought of that before right. or that's not something that I've seen before, but this is interesting or even getting things like, you know, Beth Dupree on who's talking about pain management and different styles of of that. I mean, I just think that there's so much value to bring to the entire Indo community when that happens. Sort of welcome those, those opposing viewpoints. I think they're important. And I think that, you know, those debates, um, those debates are what are going to propel this field Mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. 
accepting sort of the status quo and not having a push and pull back and forth will result in sort of the same thing we've been doing for the last 50 yeah. years. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, at the AUA, they have a segment, the AUA is the urology meeting. They have a segment um, on every day of the, of the conference called Crossfires, Controversies in Urology. And it's exactly sort of, you know, they pick a topic and then they take two opposing viewpoints and they, you know, it gets very contentious and sort of they debate the heck out of things. But those debates ultimately are what generate papers for the next two years. Mm. Um, scientific sort of inquiry to to sort of suss it out, right? Because ultimately in a debate like that, it's probably that both sides have some valid points and Absolutely. it's not a one-sided thing. And so, you know, you got to suss out what is what is true and what is false and what what is sort of uh, irrelevant. And those debates are, are sort of the, the most important debates uh, in my mind. And I wish we had more of uh, those co- mm-hmm. sort of crossfires and controversies and endometriosis care. I think that'd be great. Yeah. No, I thought that debate last year was wonderful. And, and Chuck, you know, he got up there right away and he's like, I am not just pushing meds. I'm an excision specialist. I do more excision and surgeon than just about anybody. But, you know, he's like, there is a time and a place for these other things. And, you know, he, he made it very clear, like, these shouldn't just be pushed as like, this is your only option is just medication. Like there there's, you know, maybe a, a give and take, but the reality of the endometriosis world is that none of us have it figured out completely. There's, there's no surgeon in America or the world who has everything figured out entirely when it comes to endometriosis. And so, like you said, debates like that become important that they're hearing, you know, you almost wish American politics could sort of be like that again. We're like, oh, there's some good side on there. There's some good side over here. Like, let's all come together and figure the best way forward for everybody. Um, But the endometriosis world, especially, I think is, is, would benefit from that um in you know here here's 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 two sets of very conflicting data how do we reconcile these and and move forward in a way that takes the patient into account and and listens to the patient and listens to the physical therapist and listens to the advocate and listen to the surgeon like how do we assimilate all of this conflicting data and move forward in the best way for everyone. And- so you want to hear a really cool thought experiment? And uh, I actually wrote some, it's out for publication, so I can talk about it because it's already been submitted. Um, I took uh, a controversial topic in urology uh, and I asked Chat GPT, the AI, right, what it thought. And uh, are you guys familiar with Chat GPT, that new, that new artificial intelligence? Oh, are robot? we? Yeah, yeah. So, we love it. So, we love it. So I have no idea. I live in Idaho. I don't. Right. So you don't you get it. Get, yeah. just, I'm, I'm like doing this chat from my Game Boy. Right. <laughs> when you guys get electricity, there's this thing called the internet, and then there's this artificial <laughs> intelligence robot that's read like all of humanity's nonsense on the on the internet and everything that's been ever published electronically, and it synthesizes all of that information and sort of can summarize it really well. Right. And um, we did an experiment where we asked ChatGPT a controversial question. So, so like the correlate in endometriosis would be, uh, what is the reason why endometriosis occurs, right? And, and ChatGPT will spit out, well, one reason is retrograde menstruation. One reason is, is David Redwine's theory of uh, Mulier's, uh, you know, uh, the cells being sort of laid down. Uh, one theory is lymphatic spread, and one theory is uh, uh, autoimmune sort of escape. And then you can tell ChatGPT, well, I want you to debate, I want you to write me debate points uh, that prove that retrograde menstruation cannot possibly be the reason for endometriosis. And ChatGPT will spit out sort of a really good thesis about why it's not possible. And then you tell ChatGPT, I want you to now uh, write me debate points for why endometriosis has to be because of retrograde menstruation. And then you present the AI with the fact that it's spat out two conflicting data points and let it battle it out on itself. It's wild 
how the AI is more enlightened than most doctors. I also like, I'm sitting here thinking, how did you have the time to think that? <laughs> oh, on the toilet. On the toilet. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have no idea what's happening right now, but I'm pretty sure this is the start of Terminator 2. <laughs> this is when Skynet <laughs> this is when Skynet becomes active. Like it becomes self-aware. It's like, well, we were sitting talking about talking about endometriosis and then we nuclear bombed the shit out of the world. So that's the best way to excise is with the, uh, Yeah, yeah. Bomb. Nothing excises better than nuclear warfare. Yeah. Right. Perfect. Well, I mean, you can I mean, I feel like we're only five steps away from having a robot do our surgeries though. Yeah. Not far. It's it's sooner than you think, to be honest. But you know. Hey, thanks guys for yeah. coming for on, taking the so time, much. and and just being our friends. <laughs> <laughs>